And we are here with Chase Anderson. Welcome, 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 welcome. Hello, 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 hello. So hello, everybody. This is Anxiety. This is the mental health talk show where the point is to give mental health information and to make that the resources and information accessible to everyone. We do that by interviewing mental health professionals, by talking to other uh, advocates such as myself, by sharing my own experience. And when we're not doing that, we just have open topic discussions and resource review and stuff like that. When we're not doing that, we play some games. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much, everybody, for being here. I know everybody says you're the cutest. I don't know if you can read chat. I don't know if you have it open on the side, but everybody says you're super cute. Everybody say hi, Chase. Chase, say hi, fam. Hi, everybody. Oh my God. First of all, I love your hair. I thank you for being here. I love your hair. I love your bunny buns. They're so cute. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. <sighs> Thank you. You made it. You made it. We've been talking for a long time and right. it finally happened. It's right? so fun. Oh my goodness. Okay. So how, first of all, how was your day? How are you feeling? I am feeling good. Um, just finished up patient care for the day. So of course there are notes still to do, um, oh. but no, no, I mean like notes are fun. So you get to like re-encapsulate everything that you got to work on with patients. So it's okay. Um, and then today was really beautiful. Just walked around a little bit, had lecture. Um, how was your day? It was really good. It was, I mean, it just started storming recently. So that wasn't great because I'm afraid of storms. But otherwise, oh, and my brain. So my ADHD was like real bad today. I could not finish a thought. And I, I was like, I don't know how I'm going to do this show because I can't string sentences together today. Like I would start something and I had an interview before and I was like, I, I got through it. I think we're fine. I think we're okay. I know the community would let me know if I totally had egg on my face. So I think we're, I think we're fine. <laughs> but uh, so before we get started, well, we're getting started. Tell us about yourself. Tell us about yourself. Yeah. Um, so I, my name's Chase Thaddeus Maceo Anderson, um, and I am a child and adolescent psychiatry fellow and I work at UCSF. So I'm in San Francisco and I live in the Castro, which I really love. I just started my program last year and it's a two year program for a fellowship. And then, yeah, so I get to work with little kids who, and like young adults who have anxiety, depression, psychosis, um, all different types of psychiatric illnesses, and then also a lot of medical comorbidities as well. So I'm very fortunate. Oh, how, so you, first of all, you sound so grateful to be able to experience like all of these things with people. It doesn't, it doesn't ever scare you to like experience, you know, somebody, I know that sounds really stigmatic. It's a trick question, oh. fam. Uh, <laughs> but but do, do you ever get like scared or, or worried or, or nervous? Like, oh my gosh, this person's really having a bad time. Can I help them? Like, I, I guess I'm also projecting a little bit of my imposter syndrome onto you. Like, do you ever get that? How does, how did? Tell um, yeah, I'm a black gay male in America. I live with imposter syndrome every day of my life. Um, so... well, it's been said. So it's been <laughs> yeah, said. Well, I'm just going to put that out there. Um, but I think that no matter what, even just sitting with somebody and holding space is helping them. Um, so I do get scared. Like I, I always want to do my best for my patients. I want to do my best for their families. I think some like you know me and I want to do the best I can for the world and like unite people I get scared all the time but I know that working against those fears and also just showing up and trying to be my authentic self is like will help people um and I think it's a gift to get to sit with people in their worst moments sometimes and just say like I am here you are not alone I am here with you. And I'm just self-disclosing because we're going to talk about it. I live with depression as well. So like I used to get scared about like, would this do something to me working with patient populations who experience this too? But I wouldn't choose anything else in my life um, than other than working with these kids. So. Aww. First of all, that's, that's beautiful. That's, that's, uh, but second of all, I always find it so interesting. Like there's so much, I always, Whenever I hear somebody be like, I'm scared, I, that feels like the bravest thing you could possibly say. Because it's okay to be scared. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. yeah. And it's okay to admit it. Life. It's scary. Listen, stuff is happening all the time, especially a gay black man. Hello. 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 Yeah. I, w 
wake up and like I mean I'm in a safer environment but for seven years in med school and residency I was like scared every morning I woke up I used to have panic attacks all the time I just knew how to hit it how to hide how to hide it and like I think we don't give each other license to say I'm scared um we should we should and normalizing mental illness like everybody in this pandemic has gone through things no matter who you are um and just like mental illness happens and mental like we need to be discussing that openly so I'm glad you're doing that I'm trying I'm trying listen I'm scared too so I'm I'm trying (laughs) but this this kind of segues like I I know we have like a ton of questions before but this segues really nicely so I'm going to put a pin into it and I'm going to pretend that we segued perfectly from it because we started (laughs) talking about minority stress like immediately yeah yeah Yeah, yeah. That's a really interesting point though Project Virus is making. I think the least acceptable part of mental health is the amount of people who have to find a way to deal with it. That's so fascinating to me. That like and that whole like terrible joker quote that people are now like using to like sound really deep, but it is actually a really good quote, which is the worst part about mental illness is that everybody expects you to pretend like you don't have it. Like Yes everybody's okay with you having a mental illness as long as you don't look, act, or seem like it in any shape or form. Like, it's it's a really tragic, beautiful background to, to for people to hear, like, oh, I'm bipolar. And they're like, oh, wow, that's such a backstory for you. But then, like, if you actually do something that brings that up, people are like, oh. Too much. Too much. Oh, is this you? what mental health awareness is? Because I didn't want that. I just I wanted to say, I just wanted to say, I didn't want to do. Yeah. We're just saying it like it is today. I'm sorry. I'm I already fresh. This. I'm already fresh. It's been nine minutes into it and I'm already fresh as a ham. Um, so how did you decide to go into what you're doing? Especially because you said like you live with depression and, and you, these panic attacks in the morning and everything. So what it made you go yeah okay yeah i should i should do this yeah um so i think so i've lived with depression from seventh grade and then i went to college in boston and met the like family and friends who changed my life um i met people so i went to mit for college um and did chemistry no big deal no i mean like i am i have to point out that i am socioeconomically advantaged and educationally so like I am lucky. I just had to not fall off the pipeline. Doesn't mean that I didn't experience things as a black gay male on that echelon, but like I am very protected in some way. So I always have to point that out. And that's also why should we, I should be helping other people too, to have those. Acknowledging your privilege. Absolutely. I, yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Look yes. at me. Yes. Oh, yep. all <laughs> of it. Yeah. All of it. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, got to college and like MIT was a game changer for me. Mm-hmm. Um, people are so accepting and not to say there weren't issues because like it happens everywhere sure but I got to be the black gay person that I always wanted to be um and it wasn't about me being black and gay it was like who are you beyond that what are your dreams what are your hopes that's what friends would ask yeah they were like we see you as a person and these are simply facets of who you are um I got to spread my wings um and so what we would do is a lot of friends when we would first meet is actually stay up until dawn, like walking around the Charles River. Or like <gasps> Cause Boston. it's so beautiful. I love beautiful. Boston. Mm-hmm. Perfect. Um, and just share our stories from like birth until present day. And that, I think that was already teeing me up to be a psychiatrist in some ways, but I remember just like how that let so many walls down and it built so many bridges with people who I would have never gotten to meet otherwise. Um, And then in grad school, so I stayed at MIT with my lab that I had worked with. um, And there was this time at 3 a.m. that I was like doing an experiment. And I was like, I haven't seen people in a week. I need to like do something else. So then I decided to go to med school. Um, Wait, 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 wait. So you're in a, hold on. This is, that's a, that's a big transition. You're like, so I was in a lab. I, it worked perfectly. I was in a lab. That's like me being like, so one day I walked into a Louis Vuitton and then I decided I own Dior. So, you know, like no. it just seamless. No. It was totally seamless. It like made perfect sense in my head. Okay. Okay. <laughs> you know what? That's all that, that's all that matters. Don't let, don't let me tell hey, you. We, we, got, we got here. We got, we got to where I am. It worked. It worked somehow. Um, so then went to med school and 
I, my depression right before I graduated from undergrad um, went away. Like I had had pretty bad suicidal ideation. That was like every day I had anxiety, but like the welcoming environment and how my friends validated me and became family, the depression vanished. I hadn't done therapy. Oh. I hadn't done like meds or anything like that. So grad school for two years for my master's, like completely depression free. And I was like, oh, I'm cured. Went Thanks, to med cured. school. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I'm done. Like, and then I also thought like, oh, the world's ready for a black gay person. Cause like MIT was great. Right. I went out into the real world and was like, Ooh, <laughs> <Nah>. um, <laughs> I was like, Ooh, you gotta reel that thought in. Um, so went to med school and became class president and started hearing things about race and racism and discrimination that I just couldn't believe um, people would say from people who would be future doctors. And so I still advocated for my class, um, but was bullied in a lot of ways. And then oh my like, God, wait, this is still I, at I, MIT. Do I have no, to no, this was in med school in this Chicago. In Chicago. Um, oh my yeah. Gosh. So MIT was like the safe little bubble um, in a lot of ways. And then I think it just, we had two classmates pass away in my second year too. So like guiding our class through that. Um, and then I had my psychiatry unit where we were doing like learning about psychiatry. And I was like, I don't want to touch this with a 10 foot pole. Like it will bring up things because by mm -hmm. that point I was suicidal again because mm -hmm. of the things I had experienced from classmates and like administration. Mm -hmm. And, but psychiatry, the unit, like learning about it was the most beautiful thing ever. Um, and it was the first time I learned that I was having panic attacks. Like, and I was just like, oh, there's something beautiful about how psychiatry can help you understand other people and yourself. Hmm. And then in my third year, we do clinicals. Mm -hmm. um, and so you're on rotations and things like that. And like with attendings and with patients and psychiatry is my first rotation. And I had a resident. So somebody who like has gone through medical school and now is in psychiatry training. Mm -hmm. um, he got a patient to open up about having HIV. His wife knew about it, did not know that he was gay. And then also like he had HIV associated dementia, which means oh. that his medications weren't working. And so he wasn't thinking properly, but my resident got him to open up about that and created a safe space where he felt okay to cry and like talk about these oh things. Oh my God, that's so important. Mm -hmm. And I remember sitting there and I was like, this is all I've ever wanted to do is create that safe space for other people to discuss their like their deepest, darkest and know that they aren't sitting there alone. Um, so then I also got to see the patient get better. And then I was, I loved every specialty I like rotated through, but I always was like, psychiatry is about the story. It brings mm. together science and the story in a way that's like almost magical. Um, and then I always knew I was going to do something in like child or pediatrics and child psych was just like, let's go back to the origins and see if we create a safe space for like LGBT kids and like underrepresented minority kids and just provide them with somebody who they can see like, it's okay to be gay. It's okay to be black. It's okay to be Asian American and be supported. Could that change the outcomes that they would have faced otherwise? Oh my um, God. And there's so much research to support that now. Like so much yeah. research that's like, hey, if you work on this back then, it does not come out later. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, like there's actually a study that came out recently. The Trevor Project did it. And um, basically not only does having one accepting adult like decrease your suicidality if you're a minoritized person, but also just even using somebody's pronouns, even just providing like a little bit of a safe space can protect them in ways that like we never even imagined were possible, so. That's amazing. And it's not hard. I, I just, I don't think it's hard. A lot of people, uh, and I, you know what? And I respect the fact that like, if it's difficult for you and you're putting in an effort, awesome. If right. you say it's difficult and you're like, so I'm not going to do it. That's where I'm like, mm -hmm. no, you're going to need to try. I'm going to need you to try. <laughs> just yeah. like a little bit. Like, just please. like a little bit. Just like, I don't know. Just bare minimum here, please. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And that, that can go into like a whole separate discussion of like, what is allyship and everything like that. Ooh, ooh are you ready ooh. to touch that today? Ooh, I don't know. <laughs> you know, today? Mm, not today, but you'll come back. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, I'm already inviting you back again. Like it's been like 20 minutes. I'm like, okay, when are you coming back? Do you want to schedule that now? <laughs>
<laughs> I'm um, so here for that. Uh, so you, so you, you figure out that like, hey, racist stuff is happening. Is that everywhere. the time where you everywhere? <laughs> you you have this revelation. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm not making. I I no, don't. It, was, I, it totally was true. Like when I was a kid, I got called the N word in like my private Catholic high school, and I was like, oh, it's just these like. I used to say this, and I shouldn't have. I was like, oh, it's the stupid people who like are just like bigoted. Mm -hmm. And then I got into the real world, and I was like, no, racism's everywhere. Yeah, it's it not just a, a few movement. stupid bully kids. Mm -mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, so. Then you're like, I know how to fix this. Not only will I become a doctor, NBD, by the way, but I will also start a Twitter account. And your Twitter account is just like, I am so happy. I, f I think I found you through Jess, Jesse Gold. I think. I don't know oh, how God. I found I think. I'm going to lean that way. But <laughs> regardless, you said you followed me back because I had a rainbow flag in my account. Because that's, okay, so tell everybody your like belief. I Because I, I love this. This makes me smile every time. <laughs> So I, on Twitter, like, I think it's, like, it's a great place for minoritized people to speak up and, like, have their voice. But, like, it's also, like, pretty unsafe with, like, how toxic some yeah. people are. Yeah. And so, like, I had to have a screening process. So, like, what I did was I started realizing everybody who had a rainbow flag in their bio was, like, chill and like fun and great. And, like, just, like, these little unicorns prancing through Twitter. And I was, like... I want to be like with these other unicorns. What if all these little unicorns come together and we're just like unicorning it up together? And so like whenever somebody has a rainbow flag or like that heart with a star on it or like the unicorn symbol, I or like the trans flag, like come on. I immediately follow. Yeah. Like, who's going to put that in their bio and be a shit person? <laughs> I mean, they've been through, they've been through something that they're like, no, I'm proudly flying this flag. Something yeah. happened that they're like, I'm going to be proud about this. And that takes guts and a certain type of person. I see it. I totally see it. And it's been fun. The worst part is you create this like bubble on Twitter of wonderful, kind, amazing people and you post stuff and you're like, it's like the equivalent of like, you think you're standing around in a circle with your friends and being like, guys, I just just experience this right and then everybody in your circle is like yeah 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 totally and then somebody comes out from like the side and just pokes their head in and is like actually i hate you because you're you suck and you're like oh nobody invited you but thanks for that <laughs> and then multiple people do that because the one the one person starts a line of i guess this is okay to say and then before you know it, you have a line of people so like going viral on twitter is one of the most terrifying things and you have had quite a few hit tweets so and you you're you're on a you're on kind of a little bit of a break right now so can you give us the back end on that like what 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 what's going on and why and what happened and yeah i think twitter is a beautiful place like we have gay med twitter and like we changed we even like it evolved and we made it lgbtq in healthcare because we wanted everybody to feel accepted if you're a healthcare worker in lgbtq plus and so like there's that there's black med twitter and we also have like a small group on like our own social media like where it's called wakanda forever is our group name and, oh yeah it's, it's so good um it's basically we call it therapy for black people in medicine um and i think but with that comes a lot of not only responsibility but there are just some toxic people where it's sad because i think it's a lot of projection of their own insecurities and they put that energy into the universe. And so for me, I sometimes go on a little bit of a break where like I just retweet other people. I don't write my own things because sometimes I'm somebody who I like to engage with people because I think I want people to feel seen. I want them to feel heard. I want them to know that like when they responded to me, I like read it. Like I might've like dissociated while I was like reading it because I've just been reading so much, but for like sure. I'm still there. Yeah, like I, I still want you to know that I like took the time to read it. But then there are these people who I think it's sad because they could be so much better. But I think because of things they've gone through, because of their life circumstances, because of horrible things that might have happened to them too, because of bigotry that they've imbued or like, or that's been imbued in them from America or family members, they get online and they feel like they can say anything. 
And so I usually set limits like pretty hard. I think you've seen that on Twitter in some ways. No, you've inspired me. You've been, cause I, they're literally, I've seen you clap back when I would have just like taken it and been quiet and been like, I shouldn't say anything. I shouldn't say any, and you stand up for yourself. And it's like, it's honestly, it's inspiring. Thank you. Um, I just, I, I want, there's this thing in, um, I always use this quote, but Neville talks to Harry in the end of Harry Potter. We're not going to. Oh God, I love you. We're, we're not going to go there, but the yeah, book, we're not gonna the go book there. whatever it was, yeah, ghost written. It's great. fine. It was written by somebody them. else. Yeah, yeah, go it on. was somebody wrote them. Um, mm -hmm. And in Deathly Hallows, Neville says to Harry, he's like, I noticed that when you stood up to people, other people felt like it was okay to stand up for themselves. And so it creates a ripple effect. And like, I've seen that play out on Twitter with like gay people who are physicians being like, I don't, I'm coming out, I don't care. I'm gonna put a stop to like people saying these things. But that I think we sometimes forget how much that still hurts. Um, mm -hmm. like, I'm lucky because now I'm at UCSF, I feel very safe. Like I probably will try to stay as faculty. We've already talked about it a little bit. And I feel like wonderful in a way I happened in seven years. That doesn't mean I still don't hurt. That doesn't mean that those things that I see online and the way people talk about things and the way people interact with people who are friends that I care about on Twitter, that stuff still really hurts. And so sometimes I, you have to take a step back. Mm -hmm. um, I think you, like, you're right. I clap back and like, I'm always trying to be nice about it, but I will set limits because limits are kindness in a lot of ways. To yourself and to others. Yes, very much so. But I sometimes need breaks because Twitter, I think rep it's almost the way I think about it is like the hospital represents a smaller microcosm of like America. Twitter does the same thing. Mm. Where there's a lot of toxicity. Those people are not innately bad people, but they come on and they bring this energy. And there are a lot of good people who fight against it. But sometimes you also need to learn how to take a step back from all of that and like just breathe. And sometimes not engaging is engaging. So sometimes I take a step back to be like, Hey, I don't, I'm going to just like not engage with you. And that will sign, let that silence will show that like, I, you're not worth my time right now. Um, I hope that explains like why I take breaks and things like that, but I think yeah, it's Yeah, no, that's beautiful. Okay. <laughs> Fuzz Bubbles just said what Chase is saying feels like a warm hug. Oh, I'm always here to hug people. Like, I mean, socially distanced, of course. It's so, like, like, yeah. Socially acceptable. Um, yeah. Like <laughs> So, oh my gosh, you're so lovely. I like, I want to go and hug you in per consensually hug you in person. Like, this is lovely. So I have to ask, how do you deal with it when it comes from inside of the community, when it comes from like <laughs> other doctors or other gay men or other black men like or just black people in or like just somebody who is, who you identify with as being like, you should know better because you are like me. Like, you know you've walked similar shoes, you should know better. Like, so how do you, how do you deal with that? Those are the hardest people to deal with, honestly. Um, and the thing I always bring up, and people always find this very fascinating, once I left MIT and like all this racism started happening, it was mainly from classmates and deans and people in administration. It was oh. not my patients. Patients, all they, like they were sick and coming in like, I showed up and I was like black and gay and they're like, hey, like, can you- care Are you gonna fix this? <laughs> yeah, like they don't care. Like they care about the things that matter, honestly. Like when a patient is in distress, they care about the things that matter and that's like getting better. And like, are you a doctor who is a human being? My classmates, some of them, and again, like I don't wanna make broad brushstrokes. Like I think, you know me, I there's a lot of nuance to this. Sure. And like, I had classmates who would say things that like you won class president because you were black and gay, you like got this because of affirmative action. And I was like, you are going to go interact with patients later. If you were bringing this to the class president that you elected, right? what are you going to do with your life later? And how right. are you going to interact with people? So I think it hurt the most because I cared about my class and I still love them and I would mm -hmm. do anything for them. Residency was much better because my class was really great then. Um, and the administration, there were issues, but like got to work through a lot of them. But it was such an uphill struggle. And so when somebody black or somebody gay or somebody who is a physician says those things, I actually, I take a step back. And I think we don't do that enough because we like are automatically on high Very alert. reactive, yeah. Yes, and it's hard not to be because right. you're under threat. Right. It is an actual threat right, right. then. 
um, I take a step back and I say like, okay, this person was something in me just showing up as myself triggered them because I am nice to them. I have introduced myself to them. I have done my work and I care about patients. That should be all that matters. So this is bringing up some bias in them that they are, my presence in and of itself is bringing out in them. Mm -hmm. I then slot into like, I have a Rolodex of responses. So how do I want to engage? Do I not want to? Because sometimes I do not have the energy. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Yeah. Sometimes, is it somebody I know well enough that I can take them aside privately and speak with them and trust that they will handle that conversation well? Is it somebody who will not handle that conversation well? And so I need witnesses and I will thread that needle of calling them out and repackaging what they say. So then it puts them off like on their heels in front of other people. So I have those witnesses. Or do I want to just like set limits and call it out like very bluntly? Um, I think that's how I kind of come at things is taking that step back first though. And I say like, how do I want to engage? Do I want to engage? Do I have the mental capacity and energy energy to engage? When it comes from the gay community or the black community, those ones, I think even more than physicians, cause like physician culture is very conservative. It's changing, thank mm-hmm. God. Mm-hmm. But when it comes from somebody black or somebody gay, I have to think about their life circumstances, but those ones do hurt the most, I think. Um, because they've gone through things already too. So why would you do that to somebody else? But hurt people can hurt people. But I also think that hurt people can heal other people who are hurting. Yeah. So how do they come at it? And like, are they open to learning about maybe how they could be better so they could heal themselves too? Yeah. Yeah. I I realize we went a little bit smidgy off topic. So I'm going to, I'm going to bring you back. That was a beautiful answer. And that was amazing. No, you don't be sorry. It's my job. I'm supposed to host the show properly. Okay. It just shows I get paid too much. Uh, I I love you, fam. Um, So, okay. So this brings, I I think, segues back to the thing we put a pin in, which is minority stress. What you wrote a piece on this. Let me post the link to that in chat. Um, But you wrote a piece on this about minority stress. And so like, what the heck is, what the Dickens is it? Yeah. Excellent question. So, it's this term that really came into being in 2003 and somebody was studying LGBTQ plus populations and they noticed that there were specific stressors that only applied to LGBTQ plus populations, like being called a homophobic slur, being called a transphobic slur. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That led to negative health outcomes, not only mentally, like with depression and anxiety, but also physical mm-hmm. outcomes because that person feels under stress and their cortisol levels are constantly surging. Right never get to relax. And so they get things like heart disease, like diabetes. Mm -hmm. They also start using substances Mm -hmm. because it's a way of coping and they don't have a safe environment to talk this out sometimes. Mm -hmm. After 2003, as time went on, they noticed that other minoritized cultures actually like had this thing, like this applied to them as well. So minority stress theory applies to any disadvantaged group. And it basically says that because of specific stressors that you experience because of your culture or non-dominant status, you actually will have stressors that lead to negative health outcomes that other people will not face. So like somebody white will not face the same minority stress that I will face. They could face like socioeconomic stressor, right. things right. like that. Mm-hmm. So that's how that plays out. The way I describe it is like, imagine getting a paper cut. You get one and it's annoying. And like, it's not fun, Mm -hmm. but like it heals. And you're like, okay, like I can move on. That stung a little bit. Minoritized people with minority stress get a thousand paper cuts a day. And so then like, they don't even know where the cuts are coming from eventually. And they don't know how to like heal. They don't know how to just calm down. Everything's on high alert at all times. And then they start experiencing those negative mental health outcomes. Um, The other way to describe is like Sailor Moon and like her silver crystal. Bring it. Okay. Yeah. Like I'm going to bring it. it. Bring it. So Hold on. Do I have, like, I don't have uh, Sailor have, Moon stuff. Have, oh my God. I don't okay. have to, Oh, but I did dress up as Sailor Moon one day. I don't know if you saw that. That's on my Twitter. But yes. go on. <laughs> go on. Um, so she has the silver crystal and that right. basically encapsulates all of her power and all of her mm-hmm. shine. She is. If she got cracks in that every day, it eventually shatters and she doesn't know how to put it back together. That's kind of how to think about minority stresses. Like they those things are additive. And they lead to like you shattering as a person. So yeah, that's like how I would describe it. And then my aim is to like, how do we stop that? How do we support people through it? And how do we help people heal from it? 
Yeah. So how do you do that? Especially because, so your approach at it is specifically talking to kids and again, like kind of getting it early on enough that they have the right coping tools to kind of go through life then knowing that these barriers are going to be there. So what, do, how, how do you do? I'm, I'm not saying like, tell me how you treat all your patients, but like, how do you do that? How do you help? Especially, yeah. especially since you do deal with kiddos, how do you help them? Yes. The first thing is, I assess where they're at. Um, I ask a kid, like when I do intake questions with kids, I ask them, do you identify with a marginalized group in America? Because some kids like are black and they'll be like, nope. And you're like, all right, we're just gonna move right on from all that. Right, and we'll all right, all right. Later, you don't, bond. you don't. Okay, yeah, you we'll don't. circle back. Yeah, I want them to guide how things are. Mm -hmm. And like, I want them to feel empowered because too often patients don't feel like they're empowered. Um, and they're at a, power dynamic that plays out. And so <clears throat> what I also do is once they say yes, then I ask like what group they identify with. And then I'll start talking to them about like, so because you identify as this minoritized status in America, people who are of that minoritized status can face different stressors that other people don't face from different cultures. Have you ever faced those kind of stressors? Then if they say yes, and I say like, has it been verbal? Has it been physical? Has it been like online? We delve in a little bit more. I try not to open people up too much when I first meet them of because course. I want them to feel comfortable. But then I say like, how has that impacted you? Do you worry about like when you read the news every day? Like transgender patients are worried about reading the news about like what bill will come down the pipeline today. Black patients are like, what like heinous cr hate crime happened overnight? What policeman murdered somebody else? So I ask a little bit about that just to like get us going. And then the other thing that I do is after that, I let it sit there a little bit. And I say like, I'm here to talk more about this if you want to, but if you don't, I want you to know I respect your space. Most kids have always wanted to talk about it and because they're dealing with a lot right now. Um, and then once we get to know each other more, then I ask more about the symptoms. And then what I do is I actually have a handout that I made on minority stress and what it is. Uh -huh. Yeah, and I walk them through it and like how it plays out. I'm like, what is, what parts of this fit you? Every kid that that has come up with is like, oh, this has been my life. And they're 13, 14, 15. They're like, this has been my life and I didn't know the term for it. I didn't learn that term until I was like 28 or 29 when I was doing a project with a friend um, in residency. So building that awareness early is part of it. And then we talk about how to build pillars of support for them and people they go to because community is one of the most protective things that can help them um, during those moments. So I assess like, how do we build community for them? How do we get them access to community? How do we at least get them a safe provider who can talk to them about this? Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of how I come at it. And like, obviously there's more nuances. Of course, well. of course, yeah. of course. No, so but that, that's, that's amazing. And so we kind of went back to this. Um, we, you, you talked about the fact that, you know, people were looking at you and being like, okay, so you're, you're gay and black what else like what are your dreams or your aspirations so how do you help uh kids i guess also see past this because at some point and i say this I, knowing that i'm privileged but knowing i also have disadvantages but like yeah. how how do you how do you look at a kid and go well this is going to be your life these parts are going these stressors these paper cuts are going to be there what do you do about like you that's awful to have to t tell that to like I remember recognizing that that like certain parts like my trauma was never just going to disappear my depression was never just going to be like boop and gone like yeah. how do you tell that to a kid who's 13 years old and help them understand that like you're going to be a minority and you're going to be dealing with a lot of this for the rest of your like how do you how sorry okay no this is this is great depends on the person sure. some kids are not ready and sure. some kids like don't need to talk about that right then. Um, the way that I come about it is I then delve into like their dreams because like I, my friends from um, college actually like one of my nicknames is dream because that's what they said I inspired in them and like other people. And yeah, no, they're like, I, when I tell you these people are amazing, like they're, they're, they're so the warm lovely. hug. Yeah. yeah they're the warm hug. Um, so I talk to kids about that because then I can weave in dreams and I can be like, when they talk to me about their dreams, it doesn't like, it's not even about race. It's not even about like those right. things. Just, 
talking about like I want to be a doctor I want to be like a psychiatrist I want to be like a train engineer and so I anchor things to their dreams and I say that even though there will be bumps along the way like let's anchor this kid to like a dream of theirs because that dream no matter what is like a little kernel that will hold them through like all the cuts and things like that and then I also ask them what they want in terms of community I've had kids who are like I don't really need to like go out and like hang out with all the other gay kids because I have a good friend group already but some kids are like how do I access that and so we build basically it's called a treatment plan in some ways but we build like what their future could look like and we map that out together because that gives them a lot of anchors to like life in a lot of ways um that's how I kind of come about it because I will talk to them about like this is going to be hard in some ways but I will also say like it doesn't mean it won't be wonderful and I sometimes self-disclose a little bit too Um, yeah so that helps in like me just showing up I've had kids say oh I've never had a gay doctor I've never had like a black doctor and they're like it's me just showing up shows them that you can get to that point in a lot of ways right right there was a lot of conversation about that when Kamala Harris was elected VP when Barack Obama was elected it it was a a lot of people being like oh this is an option I didn't think of this as an option that's 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 beautiful that you can that you can open up people to that option that's amazing I love that so much. I'm going to open up the floor to questions. I know I still have a few questions to ask you, but I am going to open up our, our, our loving Q, I, I think, Q, if I can spell it. <laughs> um, okay, so exclamation Q will help you. Those are instructions on how to enter your questions. So if you don't have any, that's totally okay. Chase and I are kind of going through everything. But if you do have questions, please, 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 um, you know, ask them now. Help us help us create a little list of questions and we'll go from them. So you deal with your own mental health issues. And obviously we talk about minority stress and all of that. So how do you manage your own mental health while you're trying to help people with their mental health? Yeah. Um, so now I take meds, um, or well, one med. Um, so I take an antidepressant and I also used to go to therapy. I don't currently because I'm in a much better environment. Um, but that's how I manage like the medication side of things, like the actual, like hit the ground running, like you need Mm -hmm. to be doing things. Mm -hmm. Um, I also like, I go for four hour walks. Um, I'm pretty introverted by nature. Yeah. So I put my headphones in, I have like a 3000 song playlist where I like go for walks and I just like think about writing and writing is another thing that's how I channel like a lot of that um as time has gone on I've built more and more awareness of like oh you're gonna have an anxiety attack you're the tips right feel cold oh this might be a harder week for you you're feeling a little bit lethargic when you get out of bed like my depression is in remission again Mm -hmm. but I still have like facets that show up a little bit sure they're much they're getting much better but I know and I can catch them when they're coming so it's again going back to like I think a lot of psychiatry is about awareness of our own body and mind in a lot of ways so that's how I deal with both of those facets is like do the fun things of like hang out with friends and writing and like walks take your meds and like listen to your psychiatrist and then also just like how do I know myself and like when this is coming up for me um, yeah. those are the three prongs that I think about that's amazing so do, uh, you get I'm assuming a, a, a lot of it is you know self-awareness and everything but how do you put that aside like there are mornings where I just like I don't feel like getting up and getting out of bed and it takes everything in my body and I know that that day is going to be already a freaking nightmare because I did have to get out of bed because I do have to go to work even yeah. though I really, really, really don't want to. So I know everything's going to be a slog going forward, right? So how do you do that? Yeah, that's very much like I built my own anchors to life in a lot of ways. So when I had the depression that was really severe, um, I would think about like, what am I going to do today that will maybe make this so somebody else doesn't have to go through this in the future? Mm-hmm. What am I going to do today so my patients feel safer and they have a provider who actually sees them. What am I going to do today to look out for the people I mentor so one day they don't have to fight this kind of fight? So that's how I anchored myself to be like, roll out of bed. Like you have to roll out of bed. Like patients are like waiting for you. Your friends are waiting for you. You have too much to do and too much to give 
to not get out of this bed right now. And then like, honestly, I think we don't normalize this enough, but like taking mental health days, like- Do it. Do that. Like people are like, oh, I have to go to work. But like some days you just- You don't. Like, stay in bed. Yeah. <laughs> like to be very honest. Yeah. So that's yeah. how I deal with it. Usually. Treat yourself, treat yourself to like just so basic self-care. Yeah, right. <laughs> Uh, okay, so we have questions in the queue, so I want to get them started so that, you know, we can get get you out and stuff. Um, okay, so Bliffle Splick asks, what is the favorite analogy that you use just in general when talking to kids and trying to, like, explain something tough? I use the paper cut because everybody's yeah. had one. Um, and they suck. Nobody's like, yeah. yay, paper cuts. Yeah, like, I've never met somebody who was like, that was the best thing ever. Like, everybody, <laughs> has, like, everybody has gotten the paper cut reference. And if they get the Sailor Moon reference, then like I know bonus points for the kid. Yeah, I'm like, ooh, well let's, done. Let's be honest. If they get the Sailor Moon reference, then I think they're gonna be fine. Like, because they're, they're watching yeah. Sailor Moon, so that's <laughs> right? number one. Like, they have Agreed. all the coping skills right there. Like the show's telling them how to survive. <laughs> like, I mean, I like so. Fo I I have to. We're, we're, I I have to derail us a little bit. But like, so I grew up being like, uh, as a little kid, I was like, oh my god, Usagi. Like I'm totally Usagi. I love her. Everything about her. And then as a teenager, it's like, oh, she's so annoying. She's always like crying and always hungry. Like ew. And then I got older, and I know I've told this story already, so sorry, chat. But then I got older, and I was like, oh, my God, I hated her because I was her. <laughs> like, I, I literally, I cried at the drop of a hat. I would get, like, infatuated with boys and, like, not be able to let go. And they were, like, my entire life. And uh, just everything makes me upset until it makes me really happy and until you feed me. So, like, Usagi and I have so much in common. But she <laughs> kicks butt despite all of that. She yes. kicks so much. She literally saves the world, the moon, and then a few more planets in the process, okay? Yeah. And the time-space yeah. continuum. No big deal. So, yes. yeah, she's inspired. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. She's really inspiring. <laughs> Completely agree. And I think, yeah, like, she just also embraced who she was and grew. And I think we yeah. were all on that journey. Yeah. So. Yeah. Listen, she grew up and had a daughter and then took care of her daughter extra back in time. Sorry, no, <laughs> no spoilers, but like, <laughs> um, I'm not going to tell you who it is, so it's fine. Yeah, like, who? <laughs> who am I talking about? <laughs> uh what might want to make an mha equivalent take a take a day off so you don't lose a week a eh? yeah yes. yeah that's that's the bad yeah. metaphor yeah yep. all right let's see next question no next okay uh stevie me asks how do you recommend to deal with racial microaggressions in the workplace yeah I, I love that question. It comes up a lot. Um, I have a, that Rolodex of responses that I've mentioned earlier. The biggest thing that I've learned that helps though is I repackage what somebody says and I put it back to them as a question. So Ooh. let's say somebody said like, oh, I think black people do this. Then I'll be like, I actually sit there for a second, look at them so they know, <laughs> like they know what's coming. <laughs> like, and Did then you just I'll say, say that? What I just heard from you was saying that Black people who are systematically discriminated against actually experience this. But the way it came across felt kind of like this. Is that actually what you meant to say? Mm. Because it stops them. Mm -hmm. Like it actually, I've seen people pause. And when I was in residency, one of my friends later on, this happened with somebody and I like went up against them in front of other people. And one of my co-residents later on was like, didn't she know who she was going up against by like doing that to you? <laughs> but there was that moment where everybody in the room just froze because they knew what I was going for. Um, so repackaging in the form of a question because then it makes people take a step back for a second. Um, sometimes I set harder limits too, where I say like, what you did was, a ra was racist. <laughs> and like, but it depends on your safety and your comfort level. Right. This is taking years to practice with like multiple experiences. So not great, but like I've had years of practice. So going up against this stuff takes energy and time. So also protect your space and know when you want to engage and can engage. Can I say, I appreciate people who have corrected me when I've made a microaggression that I didn't recognize was one. 
right? Yeah. I've appreciated that and learned from that so much. Like I was one of those people before that would be like, well, as a woman, I get what you're going through as a black. I've said it. I've said it. It's come out of my mouth. And I can't even like finish that sentence because I'm so embarrassed now. But it took somebody who was a good friend of mine to be like, that's a no. That's a big no. It's not the same. And I was like, but I'm trying to relate to you. She's like, no. I know you're trying to relate to me, but this is this is why. Just don't try. Just listen to me. Just listen to me and don't try to relate. And I was like, oh, this is one of those. I'm going to disappear through the floor now. But I learned. I learned. I learned. I hope I learned, dear Lord. Uh you have learned. And, like, the fact that you're even thinking about it and trying is, I think, we need to give people credit for that as well. Oh, sure, I'll take credit. Yeah, I, that's what I don't get enough is credit. That's why I have a long talk show, so I can take no credit at all. <laughs> Wee! <laughs> no, you're very gen you're very generous. You're giving me a lot of credit. I, I appreciate you. You're very, very sweet. Um, okay, I think we have one more question. Uh, very, very Mary 101 asked, how do you deal with a teen who self harms and rarely eats? So real, I'm going to disclose really quick. Uh, Chase is not anybody else, anybody's therapist here. So any advice that, um, that he gives at this time is very general, right? It's not a prescription. It's not, here's what you should do. Uh, you can give this disclosure yourself. I'm sorry. I'm talking for you. <laughs> so usually, no, no, that, that was like beautifully done. Um, so therapists and psychiatrists do not enter into treatment modalities with people that they have not met in person. We can give general advice, um, but I've never actually met, and like, I don't know this person specifically. Mm -hmm. I don't know their story. What I would recommend though, is if they are unsafe, then you take them to the emergency room. If they are not able to take care of themselves, if there's something going on and they're like decompensating um, is what we call it. So falling apart in some ways. If, but be, even before that, if they have a psychiatrist, reach out to the psychiatrist and let them know. If they don't have a psychiatrist, then reach out to their primary care physician and just let them know what's going on. So at least you can like start the process rolling of like somebody's laying eyes on this person. The other thing is if they don't have a psychiatrist, then they probably need one at mm -hmm. this point. That I have to say it's hard to find one. It's like the wait list can be huge. It can be long. But actually, psychologytoday.com. Um, yes. Has, yeah. Yep. It has like a bunch of people. They even talk about like what modalities they use for treatment. It talks about like what patient populations they work with. You might need, it depends on the insurance. So having to think about that. But sometimes also different counties have mental health access lines. And that's like a response team that actually you can call 24 seven usually. And it's like just like your county access line, mental health access line. And so they have somebody who can help out and like set appointments and things like that. But again, if somebody is unsafe and they are not doing well and you're concerned about them, then I like taking them to the emergency room is the best thing um, if it gets to that point. So that's what I would say overall. And then if you feel comfortable, talk just being there with that person too and saying like, what do you think you need right now? Because I'm concerned, but I also wanna know like, what do you need? because it also gives that person some ownership over the process a little bit. Um, so that's, that's a couple of recommendations. That that's a great, no, no, no. I think that's a great set of answers. That's, that's as, that's as wonderful as you can be, you know, generalized and, and having not known that person. And I think the, the, the main point that you're driving across is that like the best thing you can do is get them to somebody who can give them those pointed you know, pointed help that's more directly exactly directed exactly towards them. But it's hard and baby steps. Yes. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. It's so hard. Access in America sucks. But so um, I am going to I'm going to shamelessly plug my website. Uh, I do have all those resources linked out, including like Open Path Collective and places to go if you can't afford a doctor and all like I have all of that on my site. So if you go to anxiety.com, like start there just start there. It might not be where you end up, but there's a bunch of resources there. And hopefully one of them, you know, brings you brings you to like a good doctor that you can afford and that you feel good about bringing your kiddo to. Yeah. This is so lovely. Okay. <laughs> do you have, okay, this is kind of, this is kind of weird. And I actually, uh, uh, the chat will confirm I don't do this often, but do you have any questions for me? I, I really don't, I swear. 
No, I like, so I actually, I was wondering if we were allowed to ask you questions. Um, I was wondering, is there anything that I should have talked about that I didn't talk about more? So that's my first question. If okay. I get to you. Okay. Other thing is, I want to know, what do you envision the future looking like if we were more united? Ooh, oh, God, I love that. Okay. So uh, question number one, I think you did exactly what you were supposed to do at the time with the information that you were given. I, I there's nothing there, like you've left me no stone unturned in, in my mind. And I, I see that you can tell that like there's certain topics that really, really, you know, get the community going just in general. And then there's other things that like the community will, will be like, okay, but we don't really have questions as much as like, this is making me think. And mm. I feel like this is one of those streams. And so like I can tell from the community if like more is to be grabbed from this specific topic. There's plenty for, for us else for us to talk about. But from this specific topic, I can I can tell when the community is like, all right, we're noodling this. We're noodling this. Yeah. Uh, oh, actually, Martizel added, do you watch Drag Race and do you have a favorite? <gasps> that is how dare you assume? <laughs> I mean, no, it's an excellent assumption. I do. Um, <laughs> So I, I love Shangela. Like, I just love her story. And like, I know there was that Puerto Vallarta thing where like, I think she went there and like, shouldn't have. But I, <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh, not like, the cutest look. But I love that, like, came back multiple times because she has a dream and like, mm. has gotten better every time. And like, has become like somebody who's so giving to the community and like, works so hard and really wants to be there for other people. I admire that a lot. Um, I just realized I didn't answer your question. So uh, the <laughs> second one. Um, so I wasn't dodging it. I just, I no, have I ADHD. So the, 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 to answer your question, how do I envision a more united space? So, and I've talked about, I like I've interviewed enough folks, not saying that like I know everything because I interviewed a bunch of people. That's not what I'm saying. But having interviewed enough folks, I think the answer to that is, we are at this precipice, I believe, where the pendulum has swung. It, like, it's going to keep swinging back and forth. And so we have, like, on one, on one side of the pendulum, you have, like, extreme racism, right? And on the other side of the pendulum, you have, like, everybody's united and hunky-dory and, like, amazing. I think the pendulum is, like, so it's swinging between the two very dramatically because of how divided we are just just like we're we're very divided like there's all the there's all the studies to back up the fact that like as a country even as a world we are extremely divided now on how we feel and like nationalist feeling and racist feelings and all of that um so i think the other pendulum of that is individuality and how we feel about like how we feel about ourselves and what we need to accomplish in order to get to a place where we're all united. And so if on one side of that swing is, again, everybody like super, super united, on the other side of that swing is everybody feeling really, really like individualistic, I think we're on the individualistic side right now. I think we're in a place right now where everybody is saying, hey, look at me, I'm different than you. I am gay, I'm black, I'm Asian, I'm, I'm marginalized in this way, and I need you to see me for me. And the conversation I've had with, with, with other marginalized creators is we need to get to that super, super, super individualistic point before we can swing back to that really united point. Because before you can see everybody and be like, we're a melting pot, everybody's the same. You have to actually get to a place where everybody looks at everybody the same, and you cannot get to that until you have recognized everybody's individuality first and what they're up against because of that individuality. You're amazing. That was so good. Okay, I'll take my Miss America crown now. Thank yeah, you. Like, that was amazing. You were like, and world peace. And like, it was so good. <laughs> and that world peace. <laughs> <laughs> no, I actually, I actually, that has been the, I, I actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> give myself credit here. I, uh, that's, as well spoken as I haven't been in a long time. So I'm kind of really impressed with my, and it just came out. It just was like word vomit. Like this was, this, you made me think about it. And that was the first thing that I thought of. So no, no, don't give me credit. I just mean like, I'm very, I'm very happy that that could have turned out way worse and it turned out okay. So that, that's all I'm trying to say. I'm trying to give myself credit while taking it away at the same time. I don't know if you could tell. It's a fine balance. Like. <laughs> 
my gosh. You are so lovely. I like, I want to be best friends and hang out and get tea and coffee and stuff. Uh, you're on the other side of the, um, of the US <laughs> though, but yeah. You are so lovely. This is so, so wonderful. I hope everybody had a lovely time with this interview. So thank you. Um, yeah, and we need to... Uh, oh, Bluffle Splick says, we really need to internalize that we have more in common than differences and we need to punch up. Yeah. I like that. Yep. You got to punch... We got to punch up. Yeah. So tell everybody where they can find you. I haven't been spamming your Twitter link properly. I'm so sorry. <laughs> but tell everybody where they can find you. And like, if they want to know more stuff or whatever how yeah how can people talk to you yeah um so i'm on twitter and that handle is chase tm anderson link and in then, chat oh yes um and then i'm very here for like dms and stuff sometimes i get a little flooded by them so like if i take a little while to get back to you it's not you um and then also i have an instagram which is at Aries T Muses Dream Cooper. Don't ask. Like I made it back in the okay. day. Okay. 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 Um, and then I think there's like on the UCSF website, there's an email address that should be there too. Okay. Yeah. That is through your Twitter link. There's a there's a link to UCSF that mm -hmm. you can get to, and there's an email there. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your time and effort and love. And I just I appreciate you so immensely. Thank you so much for being here and taking the time to hang out with us and answering all of our questions and just being you. Thank you. Never like stop, never program. stopping. <laughs> um, thank you for having me. This was like, I love just like that we laughed most of the time. It was great. Perfect. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. All right. We're going to BRB, everybody. I'm going to be right back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.